Uh, welcome to today's webinar. We're going to be focusing on a, a topic that I'm sure is quite uh, of deep interest to all of us pretty much across uh, our lovely continent, the business of lending to SMEs, SMEs that provide the bulk of employment across most of our economies, the SMEs that also make up or contribute a significant amount to our continent's GDP as well. My name is Raman Yang. I'm a business journalist with uh, China Global Television Network uh, based in Nairobi, but my work takes me pretty much all over the place. So if you see me in your city, don't be too surprised, uh, even with, you know, COVID being what it is. Um, over the next hour and a bit, we'll be covering the question of how do we essentially make it easier for SMEs to get access to the credit that they need to grow, to expand, to become world-beating enterprises right here from Africa. And we have a fantastic panel uh, lined up for that particular purpose. Before we begin, though, I'd like to go over a couple of house rules that we're going to be covering um, today. So to begin with, uh, for all of you who are joining us in the conversation, I'd like to point out that we'd like to, to take part in this conversation. Your views are extremely important to us. So if you have any questions, any feedback for our speakers, there's a QA and a section right at the bottom of your screen. You can use that uh, to essentially put in your questions, your comments, and your feedback, and we'll dip into those uh, as we go along. If you're having any problems hearing us, hearing our speakers, um, do let us know as well. Uh, there's a team that's what keeping a very close eye on the Q&A section. They will be seeing your content as well. Um, as always, with webinars, these conversations happen online and offline. So if you happen to be on Twitter, this is a hashtag that we'd like you to use. FIS Digital Events, FIS Digital Events, uh, if you prefer. Uh, that's the hashtag we're going to be using for, for this webinar. And of course, the many others that we'll be holding in the course of the months to come. All right, then. So that is the general sequence. Our housekeeping rules are pretty much in order. Um, just to give you a brief idea of how this is going to work, we'll start with a presentation, setting the scene, um, as it were, uh, from one of our panelists. Then we'll go into a panel discussion. You'll hear from uh, perspectives from very different uh, ends of the spectrum, from lenders, from SMEs, from people who've been working on the academic side of things um, as well. But to set the stage, I'd like to bring in Shamila Hardy from IFC. Shamila, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rama. So welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. Uh, so. As Rama has already pointed out, MSMEs play a really key economic role in the global development. They contribute 40% of GDP in emerging markets. Uh, they, are, uh, they are the promoters of innovation, improvements in products and services. They are the channel by which uh, the poor and underserved actually get access to products and services. So they are the critical suppliers that link global supply chains. Or more importantly, SMEs actually contribute 90% of the job growth in emerging countries. And when you think about the fact that 3.3 million new jobs will need to be added monthly in emerging markets by 2030, the role that SMEs or MSMEs play is going to be very key. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa alone, 40% of households rely on SMEs, uh, meaning they have a household-based enterprise for their main source of income. So the investing in these enterprises can have an enormous impact, not only on GDP, but more importantly, on poverty alleviation and creating growth. This, next slide, please. When you look at the large, uh, the SME funding gap across the world is pretty large. It's estimated at $5.3 trillion. But let's focus on Africa today. The Sub-Saharan Africa funding gap is 331 billion with over half of the enterprises based in Sub-Saharan Africa saying that their financial needs are not being met. So why is that? What, is, what are some of the barriers to uh, financing SMEs? And you can see that in the next slide. Some of the key constraints faced both from a demand and supply side are information asymmetry. What do I mean when I say that? Basically, banks are looking for track records. They're looking for credit histories. And most MSMEs do not have this because uh, sometimes they are operating in the informal economy. Banks 
because the banks don't have this information, then they rely on collateral. And as we know, most MSMEs are in either trade or in the service type of industry do not have collateral uh, reals. And when I say collateral, they mean really it's, um, you know, real uh, estate is what they're looking for. So that really creates a problem for lending to SMEs. Uh, risk appetite. Banks don't actually have a risk appetite for this. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, even the MSMEs don't know whether they should be taking on more debt. Uh, the high cost of funding. Acquisition cost for SMEs uh, is pretty high. Uh, reaching you know, the small ticket size, uh, monitoring small these, these portfolios, information, again, as I said, uh, is, is asymmetrical, which makes it very difficult for banks and financial institutions to lend to SMEs. Then on the, other, on, on the other side, the capacity of MSMEs is also limited. They only perhaps know their own business. They don't really know how to operate a business. Financial literacy is weak. Uh, they don't, may not have access to markets. They might not have access to good suppliers. So that can be problematic. And at the same time, um, the financial institutions themselves do not necessarily know how to serve this market, which is very different from corporate lending. So what, do we ha what have we in IFC in the World Bank Group worked on in terms of potential interventions? Really focused on financial infrastructure. What do we mean by financial infrastructure? Is credit bureaus, which really helps in individuals create credit uh, history, track records, uh, secure transaction collateral registry, a fancy way of saying movable uh, uh, collateral so that uh, it's, a, it's possible for SMEs to put to provide collateral in the form of movable assets. Uh, we provide medium and long-term debt uh, to financial institutions so that they can own lend to SMEs. Digitization, this is going to be key. This is the way that we can actually approach um, a larger scalability at a lower cost. Advisory services, both to banks and non-financial service to MSMEs is going to be important to help them achieve, you know, financial literacy, understand their business, and able to articulate the business need to the financial institutions. Supply chain finance, this is a really good way of actually shifting risk uh, from taking on the risk of MSMEs, but and then moving it to a corporate or a, a multinational sometimes. Credit guarantee schemes offered by both banks uh, and, uh, sorry, by governments to banks can actually play a very important role because this allows uh, banks to shift or share risk with somebody else uh, for lending to SMEs. If we can go to the next slide, please. So during the pandemic, uh, of course, everything the world was put uh, asunder. So we did a study of, a, of MSMEs in Sub-Saharan Africa, trying to understand what's happening in, in, the, in the continent uh, and then to create solutions that were informed by the needs of that uh, of the of the sector. So what we found, unsurprisingly, 90% of MSMEs said they were suffering from the harsh economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Women-led SMEs, which were typically in tourism, service sectors like catering, uh, uh, boutiques, etc., reported revenue losses of over 50%. But there was light at the end of the tunnel. Despite all these issues that they were facing, 90% of MSMEs said that they plan to maintain or expand their business in the next six to 18 months. This then led us to create a, a fast track facility of $2 billion, which was focused on working capital solutions, which we offered to our banking partners to on lend to MSMEs. And in that given, as I said, uh, the disproportionate adverse impact on women MSMEs. We also created a special uh, carve out or a special segment for just uh, making sure that they were not left out of the recovery that we were offering, recovery solutions that we were offering. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So what will it take to close this MSME finance gap? Remember I said the MSME finance gap globally is over 4 trillion, 330 billion alone in, in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we've spoken a lot about this already. Financial infrastructure is going to be key. How do you create an enabling environment that will allow MSMEs to flourish? 
credit guarantee schemes uh, in cooperation with government or development agencies where banks and financial institutions can actually share the risk of lending to the sector and perhaps learn from that and then you know, wean themselves of these credit guarantee schemes. Digitization is going to be absolute key. This is the only way that we will be able to lend at scale um, at smaller tickets. Uh, supply chain finance is something that we are really looking at uh, uh, because it's another way for financial institutions to share the risk uh, because most corporates and larger companies have access to data of MSMEs that the banks and financial institutions may not necessarily have. Uh, and last but not least, non-financial services. This is something that we have learned in our lending to women SMEs, but this applies equally to all SMEs. This is going, access to capital is absolutely critical, but not sufficient. It's a necessary, but not sufficient condition. What MSMEs need is access to capacity. They need access to a community of them, of like-minded individuals so they can share and learn from each other. They need access to markets. So these are some things that we call non-financial services that are, are going to, it's going to be incumbent both on governments and financial institutions to actually provide this to MSMEs. Going forward, some of the thematic uh, areas that we are going to be focused on is going to be climate change. No surprise, right? Climate change has shown that it really impacts, again, has a disproportionate impact uh, on the most vulnerable segments of the population, MSMEs, women SMEs, rural populations, demographic changes, uh, we have all seen, um, you know, uh, forcibly displaced populations experience this in our lifetime. Youth employment is going to be key. Gender is going to be key. Uh, technological change. What this pandemic has done, uh, the silver lining, if one may say so, in this horrible situation has been the digitization and the acceleration and acceptance of digital solutions that we have seen has actually um, accelerated and grown. So online platform lending, online auctions, smart agri, embedded finance, these are some things that will grow and we are really looking to invest very heavily in these. Uh, the other last, last but not least is capital market development. Why do we think capital market development is important? Because it's only through development of capital markets will we be able to bring in a lot more long-term capital into this segment, uh, into financing this segment, uh, issuing of bonds, creating securitization, taking a, which will create room on the balance sheets of banks and financial institutions that lend uh, to some of these important segments of our, uh, which is including green, blue, et cetera. Um, Last, I will leave you with uh, one uh, uh, investment that we did uh, in India called Kaleidofin. Uh, and interestingly, Kaleidofin is actually not uh, a, a lender, but what it does, it really allows MSMEs and individuals to plan ahead for what is it that they need. And it's a platform for bringing in um, different lenders, different products. Uh, and uh, this is the way it will work, right? Uh, you. It, that you, you have to consider the whole MSME, uh, not, just, not just lending. So that's something that's going to be important. Um, so before, so I'd just like to leave you with this message. Uh, we, an economy and particularly sub-Saharan economies cannot grow and develop if they do not take care of the SME segment. And it's really important and incumbent upon all of us to work together to find solutions to help this important segment going forward. Uh, thank you. And over to you, Dharama. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Shamila. Uh, some very interesting data points uh, involved in that particular presentation. I've seen that uh, it's gotten a few requests to be shared uh, uh, among our audience. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly get around to doing that um, on the, the Advocacy or Forum website um, a little later on. Um, I'd like to get into our panel discussion. Um, Shamila's done a fantastic job in laying out the scale of the problem. $331 billion in unmet funding needs for SMEs right across Sub-Saharan Africa. 
why aren't they getting the credit they need? Um, where should this credit come from? And just as important, what do we need to do to essentially make it a lot easier for that credit to flow? Uh, my panelists are essentially right across the entire funding spectrum. So we'll dig into the, the discussion in a bit more detail. Let me introduce him to you, starting with Tyrus Bidiga. He's a group director at, of retail banking at NCBA Group uh, in Kenya. We also happen to have Philip Segwart. He's a group CEO at the Baobab Group. We also have Sokna Baimone Diop. She's a deputy managing director in charge of finance and strategy at CBAO Group at Tijari Wafa. And finally, we have Constancy. He's the group chief uh, risk officer at the African Guarantee Fund. Um, thank you very much to all of you for making the time uh, for our conversation here uh, today. Um, Maimuna, perhaps let me start with you. So that, that $331 billion number, that's, that's huge. Um, why aren't SMEs getting the credit they need from your perspective? Where's, where's the gap? Hi, uh, Rama. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased uh, today to join this webinar on the fascinating topics such as SMEs financing. And as uh, Charmila mentioned, I think uh, ensuring small firms have access to finance in the appropriate uh, forms and volumes is a, a prerequisite for Africa development and growth. And it also becomes uh, critical for their survival. Uh, in times of crisis, such as the one the world is currently facing in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, regarding the first point, uh, I think based on our track records, we know that uh, we have SMEs loan uh, and we know that there is a high default rate which has a double effect, uh, approximately 25% of our uh, market uh, is in uh, is uh, non-performing loans. That means that one uh, in four SMEs that uh, uh, that banks are financing is actually facing uh, difficulties to pay back the loans. And on the other hand, we have the financing opportunities, as as uh, as uh, you mentioned, uh, the financing needs are estimated to three hundred billion dollars. And when we when we look at the actual market in West Africa Monetary Union. Uh, the actual market is uh, is worth uh, uh, 80 billion USD, which means uh, uh, that there is a tremendous opportunities to develop and scale SMEs. But in the meantime, risk are in the highest. So I think the first thing we have to, um, or two things we have to address to lower the gap. First thing, and, uh, and Sharmila mentioned it, it's about knowledge and data. Uh, the better we, we, we know and we, we understand SME's uh, activity and SME's value chain, and uh, the better we reduce the risk and we will have opportunities to, to address this key. Uh, the second one, uh, I think, is uh, the digital agenda we have. So giving solutions uh, to, uh, to address the, the funding needs, the financing needs of SMEs, and having a specific solutions in terms of lending, but in terms of uh, remittance and other uh, solutions we can have for, for SMEs indeed. Right. Um, Tyrus, I'm going to come to you a little later on with, with a question of, um, of ticket sizes, because that, that seems to be just as important. It's, it's one thing to say there's X amount of funding uh, needs that's not being met. But um, if you know, we think of our loans in the usual typical size of you know, $20,000, $50,000, we're essentially pricing out a big chunk of the SMEs. Uh, but first, I want to come to you, Philip, um, because you've been on both sides of the fence, right? You, you've, you've spent a bit of time on ProCredit and at Equity Bank on the financing side, and now you're at the Barber Group. But what, what is it that we, we do not understand about lending into SMEs? What, what are our blind spots? Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Rama. Uh, it, it's an incredibly complicated question because uh, I, I think that everyone understands fairly well what the blind spots are, uh, but the subject itself is rather tricky. Uh, one, one needs to keep in mind that on the African continent, uh, most SMEs are actually micro-entrepreneurs and in the informal sector. Uh, and it's not so straightforward uh, to do lending to, to them. As Sokna mentioned, uh, generally speaking, you have relatively high NPLs, although that varies across uh, various organizations. Some organizations manage NPLs, non-performing loans uh, better than others. 
Uh, but in general, it's not so easy to lend to the informal sector. And um, Sharmila also mentioned some of the main challenges of, of, the, of the informal sector. That is also weak uh, financial literacy and so on. Uh, many entrepreneurs don't have proper record keeping. Uh, many very small scale entrepreneurs, in fact, are, are more uh, almost uh, survivors than proper entrepreneurs. Uh, they became entrepreneurs because they couldn't get a formal job. Um, one has to keep in mind that I think on, on the African continent, on average, is one person out of 10 uh, among the adults. One out of 10 has a proper formal employment uh, at best, and the others are not necessarily micro entrepreneurs by choice, but more by uh, it's a question of survival. And then they're, they're not very well equipped to do that. And then for banks and for uh, microfinance institutions, it's simply it's very challenging to lend to them. Um, that being said, there, there's way to address the problem, and I think that the, uh, tremendous progress has been made over 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 the last uh, ten or twenty years or so. But the gap uh, remains uh, gigantic, and uh, and uh, um, it's it's very helpful to have uh, to to have this kind of meetings where we debate about what are the best solutions, how we can address it. Uh, one of one of one of the uh, of the points which was mentioned by Shamila is supply chain financing, for example, where you de-risk in a way lending to 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 micro entrepreneurs or very small businesses uh, by uh, by tying the provision of loans to the purchase of very specific goods, um, like for example, entrepreneur sells Coca Cola um, in his uh, in his small shop around the corner, uh, his Duca or wherever that may be. Uh, and and then you uh, give him loans to buy specifically to buy these uh, crates of Coca Cola bottles. So we know he's buying Coca Cola. The money is not being spent on betting on uh, on uh, some uh, betting platform, but really to buy goods and to sell these goods. So that's a way to de-risk the transaction. Um, that's maybe one one possible way to go. Then there's other ways. Of course, data is a very important topic availability of data, getting better data, and so on. Uh, so I think that a tremendous progress has been made. And, uh, and I think that many of the points which Shamila mentioned were absolutely the right ones. But, but there's uh, still a very long way to go, that's for sure. Indeed, there is. And I'm pretty sure we'll come back to that, uh, to building out that credit, uh, to, to rather solving that data problem using suppliers as part of the solution. Uh, Tyrus, let, just for context for some some of our audience who, who may not be familiar with what NCBA has done um, a, across East Africa, th this is a bank that in, in collaboration with one of the large telcos here, Safaricom, um, built out uh, a lending and savings product called Mshwari in this market that had roughly 10 million customers and I think one point five billion dollars in deposits i don't remember what the loan number was uh, in barely two years right of, of it rolling out um, so tyrus given your experience um in our market lending those small ticket items uh, into the market uh, virtually every day because your typical loan size is around 30 dollars or less right how are you managing that 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 risk and that demand for lending to smes no, thanks, Rama. I, I think, uh, firstly, I'll agree with Philip. I think tremendous progress has been made. Um, and I'll go back to the question that um, uh, Maimuna handled. And, and I do wonder when I hear about the gap of 330 billion, how much actually credit has been provided? And I, I, I guess it's probably three, four X. But anyway, um, Mshwari has been, I, I think, a fantastic, I think, example of how to pick up on Shamila's earlier points around digitize um, and find an efficient way of de delivering um, a credit to SMEs. Um, it's, it's hard to know from our end how many of our borrowers, uh, we do about 40,000 tickets per day uh, on the Mshwari platform. Um, it, it's hard from our end of the business to know how many of those are SMEs and how many are not. But our, our rough and dirty split, we think it's two thirds of that, is, is actually financing business. From other data points that we have, uh, we know that a lot of small business people are uh, accessing credit through that you know, you, you know, portal because they get paid through those uh, wallets. And so we allocate limits around that. 
Um, a more interesting solution that is also on the back of that, uh, I'm sure, is, is, is an overdraft, is an instant overdraft service called Fuliza. And Fuliza is an even more interesting. We do about 4 million uh, transactions a day where we are we're issuing instant overdrafts based on a wallet uh, to fulfill a transaction at a, at, at, at a trader. Usually person to person is also uh, obviously covered. But what we found is that a lot of the transactions, when the telco that you referred to came to us, they had found that a lot of the transactions that were failing, 90 over nearly 90% were because of very short, very small shortfalls in wallet balance versus the transaction that the customer wanted. So if you think about it, that's that's in a in a in a reverse engineered way, uh, supplier finance. You know, we are helping the SME fulfill a trade without actually lending to the SME, but by lending to the individual. How has it worked? I think it's 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 data. Uh, we we're able to see where people what are what what are people saving, how much are they transacting, what are they uh, um, are saving, uh, how much of their inflow is going out, and therefore allocate a limit, and then that limit is enhanced as they continue to behave well uh, on the platform. And I think that dynamic, agile limit assignment as the customer ages through the platform, I think has proven a, a good success, which we are now replicating across um, our other presence markets in Ivory Coast, in um, Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda. And I'm pretty sure we'll get back to that, to, to that, to that, to, to the lessons from Amshari and Fuliza a little later, because the question around what you pointed out, how how much data is enough data, right, to assess the risk of a client, and and Kenya to some extent is a bit of a bubble, and I'll acknowledge that up front because um, Safaricom, the telco you're working with, is is. is dominant in the market, right? So it, by virtue of that fact, you've got one single point that you can essentially have um, easily verifiable data uh, for virtually everyone across the board. Um, usually when it comes to these conversations around the risk of lending to SMEs, um, an interesting counterpoint that always emerges here is that sometimes that the gap between actual risk and perceived risk tends to be much, much higher than you know reality uh, would actually suggest. And Constat, this is, this is your area of expertise. Walk us through, based on what you you do at the, the African Guarantee Fund, how what, what's that gap like at the moment between perceived risk and actual risk? Thank you, Rama, and good evening, everyone. So I, I would like to put on the table some optimistic, um, let's say, a view on the discussion we are having. I understand the point of uh, the direct lenders who are uh, Sopna, Philip, and, and Tyrus. From our experience as African Guarantee Fund working all over Africa, we have a quite positive, a quite positive feedback from this SME lending. Uh, I will give a, a, a big picture of, of this uh, positive uh, view. It's African Guarantee Fund is focused 100% on SMEs. So 100% of our portfolio is SMEs. We were founded in 2012. And in 2017, we got our first rating by Fish, uh, which is a double A minus rating, uh, the second best rating in Africa. On top of that, we have uh, an NPL ratio, uh, not, not to challenge uh, Sopna on a, a ratio, but we have a NPL ratio which stands uh, roughly around 10% over since 2012 until today. So this is the positive view. Uh, to say that we, here we have a, a company which is focused 100% on SMEs, which has managed to have a double A minus in a span of uh, five years. And I've keep, kept this uh, double A minus rating from 2017 to today. We got our rating uh, confirmed by Fitch uh, one month ago. So this is the big picture. This is uh, the positive new we, uh, we would like to share. But why are we there? We are there because we have been working with some financial institutions who understood that we cannot assess SMEs the way we assess uh, corporate, uh, corporate or individuals. We need some proper uh, risk assessment. We need some, uh, let's say, we need to fine tune our risk assessment. And working with such kind of FIs will help us to select the best SMEs or the 
the SMEs which are ready to have access to finance. Another way we have been doing that actually on the ground is uh, what we call preparedness of SMEs. So it's a kind of program, a capacity development program with SMEs, whereby we will work with SMEs. When I say we, it's African Guarantee Fund and some financial institution work with SMEs, make sure that these SMEs have a literacy, a financial literacy very high so that they can communicate proper information about the business, about the financials. And it's only after this financial readiness that the SME can have access to financing. And when getting to the portfolio of the PFI, we are at uh, this such low, or let's say acceptable, non-performing uh, loans level. So we, on our side, we are quite optimistic based on our, let's say, 10 years of experience. We have been noticing that SMEs are, yes, risky as any other borrower, but they are not this very risky animal. The double A minus rating is there for that. And also even our NPL ratio, which is there. And on top of the NPL ratio, we also have something I would like to stress on is the claim ratio. It's a bit technical, but what does it mean? It means that an SME can be in default, but the financial institution will not consider that the recovery is over. The financial institution will continue to recover as much as possible before coming to AGF to call for the guarantee. Why? Because this financial institution understood that the main constraint of the SME is a liquidity constraint. So we will not apply blindly the definition of NPL, which is 90 days in most countries and say, okay, after 90 days, if you are not able to pay your loan, you are in default and then I have, I have to call the guarantee. So most of our FI who have understood this big challenge, took the risk to continue the recovery. And it's when they see that, okay, actually this one is a very risky SME. I cannot recover anything. Now we go to AGF to call the guarantee of AGF and have, uh, like if I have to share a figure with you, we have a claim ratio around 1% per year, which is way below our, our, our pricing. So this is a positive, uh, let's say, picture I would like to share with you guys, and I will be happy to, to continue elaborating on this. Indeed, and we certainly will get, and, and we'll certainly get to that uh, a little later. At this point in the conversation, I'd like to bring in um, two of our guests uh, who've been sitting very patiently in the lobby, um, listening to the conversation and the input that we've had from, from all our panelists so far. Um, those panelists are Karuki Ngari, the CEO uh, East Africa of uh, Standard Chartered, and we also have Dr. Abiyakure Eradiri, the Secretary General of uh, the All Africa Association for Small and Medium Sized enterprises. So just to do a quick recap on that, we have Dr. Ebekure Eradiri, Secretary General of the All Africa Association for SMEs and Kero Kingari, CEO East Africa at Standard Chartered. Um, Mr. Gary, let me start with you. Um, your reactions to some of the discussions that we've been having so far around the question of risk and lending into, into SMEs. Thanks, Ramanyang. I think uh, just to listen to the panelists, it's, it's, it's quite interesting when you think about uh, the funding gap, because that clearly is quite huge. And, and we see that as, as a big opportunity. And all the issues that the panelists and the, the speaker who came, who presented, they are, they are all valid. Uh, but the question that we need to start asking ourselves is then how do we address the gap? How do we narrow that gap that, that is out there that we need to create? Because that's an opportunity. And uh, when you look at all of us, we, are all, uh, we all have commercial interests. So if there's an opportunity, what is stopping us from going out and closing on that gap? I think it's very, very, very important to ask ourselves that question. But there are two things that I would like to just, just like to address. I think when we, when we brought SMEs, especially in, in this part of the world, uh, and not only Kenya, but the entire African region, they are very, very different uh, aspects of SMEs. There's a world we call the micro, the really small, uh, the really small business and traders who do a business on a daily basis. And uh, we know how that has transformed uh, and they continue to transform most of our markets. When we look at uh, capital cities across Africa, you'll always see the traders on the roadside and those are SMEs. Then you go to the more, uh, I would call it less formal. And then you go to the more formal, then you go to the much bigger business at SMEs. And as banks, we've more or less tended to concentrate on the bigger, the more established SMEs uh, to do business with because the, 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 the need for structures, 
the need for business cases, the need for track records becomes the dominant factor to decide how you're going to do the lending. Um, however, we see an opportunity. At Standard Chartered, we see an opportunity. Technology is coming in. You can actually use technology to do a lot more with SMEs. And I think that's going to define in the next couple of years how you, you're going to start seeing lending taking place, that the use of technology and an alternative sources of data to make the, the, the decisions. For instance, you could be a supplier to one of the big, uh, one of the big corporates there is data there because that means you've got you're supplying your goods you can be able to track the the pay, the, the movement of those goods and that could be an opportunity to 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 start to to finance that kind of entity that is one area and as because all these smes are interlinked especially when they've got the the bigger companies they're supplying to or buying from or they are or they are distributors for that becomes a big part that we can say actually you can be able to do this without asking for the SMEs to give you loads of track records of data, but you can maybe easily be able to get all that data from the distributor, the main company you're distributing for. And that way technology can help you to do to be able to do that. And then finally, ease of blended finance. How can you work together with other uh, maybe long-term partners who want to invest for the long term and the bank would provide the short term uh, whether it's trade products or whether it's short-term financing overdrafts but then there's a longer term like uh, that's what most companies would be doing whether uh, financial institutions that do it for the long term or private uh, private equities so it's all a question of looking at different mixes of financing but understanding the smes from where they are and then you help them to to try and structure them in a way that you can make financing viable and then technology will bring all that together for what you need to do well, Constant is on the call, so I'm pretty sure we can we can organize a sidebar chat uh, between AGF and Standard Chartered on that front. Um, but let's let's just get back to that data question. How much how much data is needed from a banking perspective? How much data would you be comfortable with to be able to say, okay, I am comfortable lending to this particular SME? Because sitting from my from my end of the corner, right? I, I'll 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 say, but I have a bank account with this particular institution. I've got a six year track record of my transactions there. You can see money moving in and out of my mobile wallet uh, from point A to point B. So how much data is enough data? How much data is enough data? Enough data to be able to make an informed decision. So if that data, if for instance, it's based on the turnover of your account. So you come and tell me, oh, I want a $10,000 $10, loan. Then I've got to be able to see that the turnover in your account can support a $10,000 loan because at the end of the day, the banks don't want to, that we want to make sure and that's what we call responsible lending, that when you take money, you can be, the, 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 your, your activities can be able to pay off that loan. That's enough data. But now if you come up and say, oh, look, I don't have enough data, but I've, got, I've become a supplier. I've won a tender to supply. I've, be, I've now become a distributor for this big company, that this big manufacturer or a telco, the one like the one you're talking about, all the telcos across, whether it's all the telcos across our region, I'm now a distributor. Then you need that data to see, okay, actually, this person is a distributor, this is how much they're consuming, this is how this is the kind of helping, this is the this is the kind of help they need. That's enough data. I don't think you'll see banks shopping around for a lot of data because additional data won't help you. It's either the data coming through your account. That's why the bank statements are always required. There's no other data. <laughs> or you're dealing, you're working with a supplier, or a, you're, a, you're, a distrib you're a supplier, you're a, you're, a, you're a distributor of a major telco or any manufacturer. That's the other source of data. Those two data points are enough. Okay, one last question for you before I let you go, and then I move on to, to Dr. Rodiri. Um, from, from a regulatory perspective, um, and, and I know in, in some respects, um, in East Africa, perhaps we've gotten a bit of uh, leniency from, from our regulator. They, they essentially tend to be a, a bit of ahead of the curve uh, in essentially allowing institutions to try out new ideas, see if they work, see if they don't work. But from a regulatory perspective, what would be on your wish list to make it easier for you as Standard Chartered to lend to SMEs? I think there are, there are several. I think is, one is definitely pricing for risk. You've got to be able to price properly for risk. And the SMEs, just like individuals, have, have very, very different levels in terms of the pricing. So if you're able to say, based on the business that you're doing, when I look at the data, I should be able to load X percentage in margin. So that I, I price it well for risk. I think that, that, can, be a, that, can, be a, that can be a game changer. Because then, then that allows even the riskier SMEs or MSMEs to be able to access credit and you price it accordingly. And then you also make sure that the, 
the better borrowers, the better SMEs are not subsidizing the riskier borrowers. That can be, that can be one way. Uh, there's a lot of progress has made, it, made in Kenya, as you know, with risk-based pricing. Uh, that's, still, that's still work in progress, but that's an excellent way of saying, how do we expand the space by having risk-based pricing? So you are, approach, you, you are approaching it from a risk perspective. That's, that's one very good place to start. All right. Uh, Karuk Ngari, uh, CEO at Standard Chartered for East Africa. Asante Sana, thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, Dr. Eradiri, if I may come to you. So you represent the All Africa Federation for small and medium-sized enterprises. You've been listening to our conversation uh, 30 minutes in. What are your initial reactions? What stood out for you? Thank you very much, uh, Rama. I, I bring warm greetings to each and everyone down here. Um, it's been... Uh, quite an interesting conversation up till now. Uh, let, 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 me, let me digress. I want to take a different view to uh, the situation before us. Um, for, for Africa, we must begin to demand for a new finance recipe. For the last um, 70, 60, 70 to 80 years, we've been going about it the same way, the same regular Western approach to finance. And for Africa and Africans, it's not, it doesn't seem to be working for us. So why should we continue having the same approach and then not getting the results we want? In, in another parlance, it would be stupid or it would be foolish for you to do the same thing the same way and you're not getting the same results yet you are still carrying on doing the same thing. Now, let me put it this way. I think that the Western, the Western template for, uh, for finance uh, is difficult for African SMEs to, to meet. And so uh, what, what we are campaigning, the, the conversation here is that we should have an alternative. We're not saying that you should take, you should throw away in total uh, the foreign colonial approach uh, to finance for, for SMEs. We're not saying that, no, but we are saying that we should begin to reconsider a new approach because if you want our SMEs to, um, to access finance year in, year out, then you have to make the, the, the finance Afrocentric. Um, what, what we have seen in the, years, in the years past is that there are finances always available for SMEs for Africa, but the SMEs are not able to, I mean, from January to December, the SMEs are not able to access and the same funds are, are, are returned and then brought back in the new year. And it doesn't work that way. Um, let, let me apologize firstly for my, uh, my, my I'm, I'm having a technology glitch and so my, my, uh, my videos are not coming up. But the issues are germane and what, what do we need to do about this? We need to have our DFIs, uh, what, what, would, what, would, I, what do you, would you want me to call it? We need to have a fit for purpose DFI for Africa and for African SMEs. If we are talking Let me about... Let jump in briefly there, uh, sir. There's, there's an interesting question, um, roughly along the same lines that you have here from, from some of our audience. Uh, this is from Wamate jones Idiko, and he's basically arguing that perhaps lenders should consider lending to SMEs through business membership organizations. So essentially, it would be your lending uh, base, or rather your quote-unquote collateral would essentially come through the fact that you essentially have this business organization that's willing to stand in and act as a sort of guarantor, which sort of fits in with uh, our, how essentially our societies have worked for a fairly long period of time. Are those the sort of ideas that you'd like to see more of in the market? Exactly. Um, incidentally, Mr. Womet uh, Idikio is, is part of our organization and he knows our thoughts and that's correct. We want BMO, business membership organizations, to uh, as it were, be the platforms to engage because most of our SMEs in Africa, as you know, are informal. And so by the time you set your templates uh, for uh, uh, audited accounts, uh, statement of accounts for, for six months or 10 months or a year, they can't meet it. And so we must have a new recipe. And, 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 I, and I agree with uh, Mr. Womet because that, that is the, that's, the, that's the, the voice we are, we are leading. We're leading a new voice for that to say, Let's have a new recipe. And then the next thing I should be talking about here is, you see, DFIs for Africa need to have a service policy review. Very important. You know, if you check, if you, if you have a critical look at what they have been putting out to us, it's been rigid. They've not rejected it. They've not reviewed it. So we want them to have a review to it. It has to be friendly enough. 
if our give SMEs us, have us, to access give, it. Give, give us some details on that, because someone would argue that, look, we've got, you know, the South African Development Bank, you've got the East African Development Bank, there are all these homegrown DFIs. What is it that they're not doing right at the moment to make it easier for money to flow to SMEs? Unfortunately, uh, they, are, they all still operate with a standard uh, operating procedure, an SOP that is Western-based, unfortunately. We need to grow our own templates here in Africa, a template that can speak to Africa, a template that understands the, the, the issues of Africans. Now, I tell you this, you are an African, and so I'll give you a scenario that you should understand. Every African is, is communal. They are from villages, they are from communities. And in some villages and communities, people from a particular family are known not to tell lies. They are known for a particular profession that they have gone through for a number of years from their, their forefathers and all that. So what am I talking about? They may not have the regular Western templates of meeting um, uh, audited account statements before they are giving uh, finances and all that, but then they know their trade. They know that by 2 a.m., if they go fishing and they throw their nets at a particular point, they will catch fish. They cannot explain it to you. So now, what do you want to do about those kind of SMEs? Do you want to financially exclude them? So this is what we're talking about. Our SMEs are different from SMEs in other parts of the world. And so we must have a finance policy that is Afrocentric. It has to be able to connect with, with, uh, uh, with, with the kind of things that happen in Africa. We're talking about African solutions for African problems, isn't it? We're talking about an AFCFTA that's supposed to succeed with SMEs as the engine room for that to succeed. And how can that succeed if the SMEs do not have access to finance? And how, how can the access to finance be the Western template for an African situation that we have to salvage? All right, let me, let me, bring, this, let me bring this back to, to, to regulatory issues because, you know, Dr. Karukingari earlier on was speaking about um, risk-based pricing being allowed by regulators. But from your perspective, how then do we fit in this idea of communal lending and bringing that, that sort of cultural nuance into the lending space? How do we get that integrated into what our regulators have to do? If you're pitching this, for example, to say Dr. MFLA over at the CBN, what would you tell him to do? Well, one of the first things I, I will tell him, which I have done in any case, um, about four or five years ago, uh, we had the, the engagements with the vice, pres vice president then of uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And what was the issue? Ease of access to finance for some funding for SMEs. And what are the, the issues then are the same issues that cut across Africa and they still exist. Not all SMEs, uh, financial literacy for all SMEs are not equal. And so one of the first things you should be talking about here is to say, okay, fine. Can we have the BMOs to access funding? Can we have cooperatives? Cooperatives can guarantee each other in order to access finance. Can we have other more friendly templates? You know, what about taking away altogether the issue of collateralization? Today, we are beginning to talk about um, uh, movable collateral, which is fair enough. That in Nigeria, that came in as an intervention that we brought in. So that's fair enough. But besides movable collateral, what are the issues when you want to access finance? The major issue for finance is character. You know, And so if you can get character right for anyone that wants to access finance, then you are sure that you are going somewhere. Now, coming back to Africa and communal approach, all Africans are from communities, are from villages. And so if you have a community head who knows his subjects, who knows what they do, who can speak for them, who is ready to put pen to paper on their behalf, that should suffice. And so what I'm trying to say is that on a general note, the DFIs in Africa and those that want to engage SMEs in Africa should have a room for an alternative uh, uh, approach to, to SMEs for Africa to access finance. That's, that's our position. That's what we are conversing. That's what we are promoting. And that's, that's what we are, we are leading voice in that direction. We've said this to the African Union. We've said this to the European Union. We've said this to UNECA. And in every um, um, uh, uh, public space we find ourselves, we advance this discussion because it is very, very important. We must begin to retool. And that retooling has to be holistic. Whatever the SMEs are doing at a particular background, the, the DFIs should also latch in. How can we have the Africa that we want? 
How can we achieve the agenda 2063 we, we speak about if we're not all on the same frequency? All right. So this is right. what the situation is, and these are our thoughts. All right. Thank you. Underst understood. Dr. Ebiakure Eradiri is the Secretary General of the All Africa Association for Small and Medium Sized Enterprises, there, uh, with an interesting perspective uh, with respect to the question of communal lending. Um, so let's get back into our panel discussion with our four panelists here uh, Sokna Maimona Diop, uh, Taris Mediga, Constant Z, and of course, uh, we also have Philip Sigward uh, in the conversation. Um, Philip, um, you've been listening into the conversations with our guests. What what struck what stood out for you there? Uh, thanks, Rama. Yeah, I, uh, I found it in incredibly interesting, and I must say that a lot of very in, uh, important points have been made. Um, at, at, at the point that that financial services need to be adapted to the society in which they are operating. You can't take just a model which worked maybe in one country and then copy it and uh, roll it out somewhere else. Um, and it's true that on the African continent, which is still largely uh, a rural society, many people live in villages or grew up in villages and, um, and uh, the community plays a very important role, probably more so than in, 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 in Western Europe or in the United States, um, that, that, uh, that Finance needs to, to, to be adapted to the way how society operates. To some extent, this is being done in microfinance with group lending, uh, to some extent. And, and uh, some banks and microfinance uh, organizations have been incredibly successful in rolling out group lending, which, by the way, was developed uh, more in Asia, in, in Bangladesh, by uh, Dr. Mohamed Yunus. Uh, but uh, the society or the way how society operates in Bangladesh in rural areas is not so different from the way how it operates in Kenya or in Nigeria or in other places. Um, and uh, I think that this is uh, something that, uh, that, uh, that definitely works very well. I think to some extent, maybe um, not enough has been done, been done in that respect to, to see how, how group lending can be made more efficient, more effective, and so on. There's also the concept of chamas in Kenya, for example. Chamas play a, an incredibly important role. I think that everyone in Kenya is a member of a chama somehow. And uh, in, in Francophone West Africa, these are the tontine and so on. So, so I think these are definitely ideas which should be explored and adapted uh, uh, and, and taken on by the financial sector. Uh, I tend to agree that, um, that banks, in a way, when they started operating on the African continent, uh, many, uh, many of the banks which started operating were established at the time when, uh, when, uh, when most of uh, the African country, countries were still colonies. So they j just took this, uh, you know, this colonial template in a way and, um, and implemented it in, in, uh, in the countries of operations. And it's, it, it needs to be adjusted in a way. So I tend to agree with uh, the comments of Dr. Ebi um, uh, completely Dr. agree Ebi with Dier. that. Yeah. And I took note of it, and uh, I would think myself uh, how we can, at uh, Baobab Group, which is a microfinance group, how we can uh, be, uh, roll out uh, you know, products which are more adapted to the, the communities in which we operate. Uh, uh, Sokne, how, how, do we, uh, how, does, how do we retool banks uh, for that group lending approach? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm just sitting back and, and thinking about the, 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 the the technical challenges involved in pulling that off but you know how do we, how do we make it a reality instead of you know us having this conversation here in this webinar we, we actually roll it out as a product say in six or nine months yeah 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 Ramo. and um, i think it's uh, it's interesting um uh just uh, what uh, dr era jury mentioned about uh, uh, community and uh, and uh, having a good knowledge of uh, of SMEs and clients. I think for us, uh, what's important for us is uh, at the bank is to understand the the the, the whole ecosystem of SMEs. Uh, to 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 understand with. Uh, with whom they are dealing with, uh, that means their clients, their suppliers, um, their competitors, and and have a good knowledge of, of uh, on all the the, the value chain uh, and their sector and and and, and understanding actually uh, having a good good understanding of uh, of their so of their activity. Uh, my my conviction on this question is that. Uh, 
uh, the more we understand SME's community and, and we have a good information, we have a, a good data and knowledge about their, their ecosystem, then the better will be our risk assessment. And, and we, we have actually some alternatives. Uh, we, are, we are putting in place some alternatives in our, our models and our risk assessment to, uh, to, to take into account this, uh, this community, or I would say this uh, ecosystem knowledge. Uh, in in our ability to to to, to address the SME's financing needs, uh, I think uh, the the more important thing is there is uh, having a large data uh, on the, on the ecosystem on SME's ecosystem uh, and bringing back on on our digitalization agenda on the on the technology uh, gathering all the information we could have uh, on smes and having an appreciation a good uh, 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 a real assessment on other we, we are not even if we don't have financial statement even if we, are, we don't have the the financial data we we could we, we would need for a large corporate we can have alternative approaches to to just assess the risk and uh, being able to 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 loan and to lend properly and actively the, the SMEs. Is, is, is that something you'd be able to do as as a standalone institution, say just to loan a CBIO, or is it something that you'd have to sort of build out as an industry, so that you have a much wider data pool to work with? And, and I'm going to come to you with this exact same question, Tyrus. Absolutely, I think the, the the risk assessment can be addressed individually in banks. I think uh, risk appetite is something that banks have to work on on the single basis. But on the other on the on the other end, uh, we need on the market to communicate uh, to have this kind of credit bureau where we can share information about our clients and that would reinforce the information and the risk assessment and data we have on on the market and on SMEs and I think this will be able to uh, to, to, to have more confidence and have more information when 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 it's uh, it in, it comes to to financing SMEs indeed indeed okay so Tyrus same question to you the question around building out this these data sets and especially the question around suppliers because yes you may not have my information on say a credit reference bureau I may only have a, a brief track record with 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 a bank but the people I do business with might actually be in a better position to tell you whether or not I actually have the stable cash flows I claim to have. Um, is that the sort of product that you might build by yourself as NCBA or is it? Is, or should that be an industry-wide effort? We do actually have um, in the market uh, alive today a product that actually does exactly that and karaoke uh, referred to the use of digital for that. So supply chains like beer, cigarettes, um, soda, bread, milk, you know, they're all interventions where you've got a manufacturer, um, distributor, wholesalers and retailers that have data that they produce every day. You know, we, we know what their shelf lives are. We know what their restocking cycles are. And that's information that can be used to the point that was made earlier. How much is enough data? It's the data that I need to make a yes or no decision within the credit stats that I've taken. Um, we've seen alternative uh, lenders in the market, even using mobile phone, you know, how you store your names or, or where you live, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we, it, it is active in the market. Um, again, I'll use Kenya and, and those are reference to Afrocentric approaches. And I think they're great examples in Kenya. As I mentioned earlier, supplier stock, you know, Jazz Adukar and products like that. I know Philip will be aware of those um, that are active in, in, in the market today. Um, and when you speak to those uh, traders, they actually are buying more than they did before that intervention happened. The distributor is distributing more than they did. And that's all good. Um, why is that not scaling? I think there are different uh, margins that are in play. Um, there was a discussion around pricing for risk. That is important. Um, some of them were not able to provide that intervention because the cycle and the margin in play in that supply chain does not allow for some any financial arbitrage, which is the opportunity for us to provide sub, you know, credit supply profitably, uh, but the trader also being able to maintain a margin. And, and that will remain a challenge that perhaps needs an alternative solution. Um, but um, 
the short answer is yes, these, these models are in play across multiple countries in Africa. Uh, I think for those markets and organizations that are interested in those, uh, I think studying those and sharing that as knowledge uh, across industries through bankers associations would probably be helpful um, um, uh, because they are, they are great success stories uh, across, across the branch to learn from. Okay, so we have solutions that we need to scale them. Um, Constantine, let me come to a question here from 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 the audience. Um, one of the reasons being cited uh, by SMEs uh, is that at least the argument that is being made is that banks often do not have the requisite customized analysis that's suitable for SMEs, and that therefore creates unforeseen, for lack of a better word, um, inefficiencies across the entire supply chain and makes SMEs jump through very many hoops and access is is not guaranteed. To, to build on that question and what Dr. Eredivi um, mentioned a little earlier, how then do we build out um, our financial systems, our tools for analyzing risk and for providing guarantees in a way that takes account of these, for lack of a, a better word, non, um, uh, non-quantifiable, for lack of a better word, um, uh, elements of, of risk assessment? Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I will be very brief on this one because I want to jump on uh, a comment made by uh, Dr. Raderi. So on the risk assessment, uh, clearly we, we all agree here that we cannot apply uh, like the risk assessment which is today performed on corporates. It's not suitable because on corporates we have some very clean financials uh, where things are done almost all the same, uh, almost wherever we, 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 we are seated. On SMEs, it's uh, something quite different. Uh, most of the time, we don't have reliable uh, financials, and then we need to rely on, on some other qualitative information. Luckily, we are moving on, on, on uh, the, mobile, the mobile banking, uh, which are more and more being integrated to, to, to the banking system, uh, which also will provide more information, quantitative information in terms of cash flow, but also qualitative information. Some qualitative information we saw uh, some lenders using is, for example, uh, the relationship between the, the, the borrower and his family, for example, his close family, the number of calls the person can make. So there is a new credit assessment which is going on, which is being built, and which is using as much information as possible to, to fine tune the credit scoring based on the community we are, we are, we are, we are studying. So, how do we do that at AGF? Uh, generally, we put in place a capacity development again uh, in cooperation with the FI, the financial institution. So we agree to hire a, a provider who will come sit and have a deep analysis of how we can build a model just for this uh, segment, this SME segment. So it's not something we can build and deploy everywhere. It's where I, I concur with uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Eradiri that we cannot copy paste. So when it comes to lending to SMEs, we cannot copy paste. It's uh, a learning process on the ground and each financial institution has to make its own assessment. So on this one, we, we are very op uh, open to work with any financial institution to contribute as part of uh, one of our products. Because uh, most of the time when we talk about African guarantee fund, people will think about guarantee. But guarantee is one product, but one of our main product is capacity development, where we, we, we work together with the FI. NCBA is on this call, and we, we were very happy to work with NCBA to put in place the, uh, this kind of, of solution to, to help, uh, uh, let's say, um, improving the, the, the risk assessment on a certain segment of, of SMEs. The reason why I wanted to jump on a comment from Eratory is the implication of the FIs. Here we are talking about the financing of SMEs, which is something very local because of all the risk assessment you are talking about. So it's very local. And when it's local, we need local players to be the end lender. Uh, we cannot ask uh, AFDB or I don't know all these big players to lend to SMEs that can put in place some chain. Uh, like what they did with African Guarantee Fund to help the final lender to lend to the SME. But when it will come to lending, the local player has to play its role. And the resources are here. 
you know, why would we take the 50 top banks, the, the first 50 banks in Africa, they have a total equity of 125 billion. So with the 125 billion, if you want to apply the leverage, you will, they will have a capacity of 1,500 billion. And the loan book is only 800 billion. So we have a financing resources available only with the 50 top players in Africa of 700 billion, which is more than two times what we are talking about here. So the resources are present and what we need or what the DFI needs to do on this SME lending is to help to, let's say, create the condition to lend. So give more guarantee because one of the issue is the collateral. We replace the collateral by the guarantee and also build the capacity of SMEs to help them to have more bookkeeping, to have, a, let's say, clear financials and, and so on. So this is uh, the point I wanted to stress on, on top of the risk assessment. All right. Um, I know we're essentially running close to the clock on this one, but I want to, I want to wrap up with, with a focus on the question around um, guarantees and how this might change lending behavior or not. There's an interesting question that was put in in, in the chat a little earlier from Samuel Shidorov, um, asking about the views from the panel on guarantees. The argument um, Shidorov's making is that financial institutions and governments uh, prefer not to promote the guarantee instrument in order to not increase expected defaults due to the moral hazard problem involved. Um, what are your views on, on that particular point? Are, are credit guarantees provided perhaps by governments especially because they understand the local nuances of lending to SMEs? Are those guarantees working as they should? Uh, Sokne, let's start with you, then Tyrus, then Philip. Yeah, thanks, Rama. Um, I think regarding the guarantee schemes we can have from uh, government. Um, the, the big issue now uh, when, when looking at uh, the, the land, not our, our lending approach is that we cannot base only on, on collaterals and collaterals that has been given by, by the, the government. What we would first look at is the, the SMEs, uh, I mean, the, the, the vision of the SMEs, the activity of the SMEs, the, the capacity of the SMEs to, to, to bring cash flows and, and to be scalable, actually. And the, the question and the matter of, of collateral is not the, something that we are putting on the balance when dealing with, uh, with credit uh, credit reports when, or dealing with credit uh, assessment, actually. This is the second question, but the first question is just the viability of the, the enterprise. Uh, is there a cash flow that will sustain the, the activity and will be, uh, will can the repayment we, we can, that can be uh, uh, based on this cash flow that we, that can repay actually the loan we are we are we are looking at, and then the question of the the collateral it will would be the third or the fourth uh, actually thing that that we are looking at, that we are looking at. So that will help. Uh, of course, it will help on the, 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 the risk assessment and our 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 analysis of uh, analysis of the, the the credit, but it's not the the key point. Uh, on what we, we are looking up. All right then, so guarantees not the key issue there. Um, Tyrus, no. your perspective on, on, on guarantees, um, how are they working out in the, in the East African context? I, I would agree. I, th I think, do they help with access? Yes, they do. Um, do they work to underwrite risks? I guess we'll see. I, I mean, with constant mention that their claim rate is 1%, that, that's evidence right there that, you know, but, but why, why is it 1%? I think we often forget banks are businesses. You know, banks put capital at risk. You, you know, I don't get, I don't make money from lending. I make money when I get paid back. Um, and so at the fundamental basis is what are the fundamentals of credit, right? Why are you borrowing? What is your business model? What are your cash flows? Because cash flows is what pays me. Guarantees, security, collateral, it just ensures me against if things go bad, either because I made a bad decision or you made a, a bad decision as well. So, so I think credit guarantees do help with access for those that have good, robust, bankable proposals. And the only thing standing between me and IS is that question of how do I protect myself on the downside if, if, if things, things work. 
So, so at our bank, we... let, let me just yeah. flip that question around because I know there was um, there was a lot of work that was being put into forming a credit guarantee scheme um, among Kenyan banks in, in in our market, but is. Given given the, the the question around risk pricing that that uh, Karyuki Gary mentioned a little earlier, the the inability of banks to be able to actually provide differential pricing for different clients, because you know a, a manufacturer that's been providing, um, for argument's sake, uh, running a beer distribution unit uh, business in in Western Kenya is very very different in their risk profile from say the guy who uh, is providing my green groceries um, when I come into the estate every day. So is, is a problem there that maybe uh, risk, the, the, ability, the inability to price risk is a much bigger problem than the lack of availability, for lack of a better word, of, of guarantees? Yeah, yeah, it certainly is a problem. I, I think we would like to be able to price better and differentiate for your better client um, than, than that. Than the, than the one who's less attractive as a, as a credit risk for me to take. Because in that capital that I referred to that I'm putting at risk, if I'm taking a larger risk, I want a higher return for. Um, so yes, that, that is an issue. Um, how have the credit guarantee schemes work? Our, my, our experience in Kenya has been that um, uptake has been lower than had been initially anticipated because we still need to make good, robust credit decisions in the first place. And, and so what are we doing to, to help with that is, uh, as the point that has been made earlier, is help that client to structure their turnover and accounting better. We are spending a lot of time to teach business people about cash flow management. And it's quite surprising that people who've been in business five, 10 years are attending seminars and, and thinking, okay, I didn't think that about my cash flow. How should I manage my debt cycles? Um, how do I balance my credit and my debt cycle so that you, you know I, I, I generate enough cash flows and what have you? So I think the credit guarantee schemes do help, Rama. Um, uh, certainly with supporting those clients with good proposals that are really struggling in the ultimate decision point for how do they secure their overall exposure. Larger customers are obviously are not, uh, oh, sorry, one more point I wanna make about credit guarantee schemes. The biggest challenge we've had as well is that moral hazard. You know, there's, there's this perception that because the government will pay, you know, well, I, let me just take a punt, I'll see what I can get and maybe if it works, I'll pay. If it doesn't work, I know someone else gonna pay. That has been a major challenge because it, it it's not a social scheme, it is meant to, support the growth of enterprise. And so a lot of the work we are spending is first educating applicants who want support through those credit guarantee schemes, uh, what the, 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 the success criteria, what the um, um, qualification criteria, what is the sort of credit we are supporting and which ones are we not supporting. Um, uh, and, and so we are getting some success with those. Those that then access that now understand that this is an umbrella that protects my access to credit and so my continued good behavior under it is probably going to sustain me accessing it and that's a really key point um i think they will work if those who are accessing it are well educated that um it, it's it's it, in the same way i buy insurance for my car i don't go crashing and banging at everybody on the road because somebody else is going to pay i've got to protect the franchise for which i'm borrowing that really is where the key is uh, Philip, your views on, on credit guarantee schemes, especially with respect to, to the market you operate in, microfinance? Uh, yes, well, uh, I agree with everything that Tyrus has said and uh, what, uh, what the others have said before. Uh, it's just one piece of the puzzle. Uh, I think that there must be many bankers in the audience and everybody remembers the, C, the three C's of credit analysis, which is character, capacity to repay the loan and, and collateral. Uh, and collateral just uh, plays an element. Uh, the guarantee can replace part of the collateral, uh, but it's not it's not the key decision making element. Uh, uh, the, the character and capacity to repay the debt are, are absolutely essential. Um, so I agree with everything that Tyrus has said. Um, no, nothing nothing to add to that. 
All right, then. Um, we're closing in on, what, 6.15 uh, p.m. So um, at, at this point in time, you consider we've been running for the better part of an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, it's been a fascinating conversation from, from all our panelists. I'd just like to get to give them the opportunity to essentially put in their, their, their closing views. What, what is the one thing that we should take away from this conversation around SME financing? What, what do we need to do? So we have this conversation Next year, we're not talking about a $331 billion funding gap. Uh, perhaps we're talking about something that's half that number. Um, Sokna, you get the first word. Yeah, thank you, Amal. Uh, I think there, if there is one thing we have to, uh, to get in mind, and uh, it will be the takeaways. Uh, we talked about SMEs, uh, and we know that SMEs is, is a large uh, perimeter, actually, a large market. We are dealing with micro enterprise, small, medium enterprise. And I think the, the, the one advice I think I, I, would, I would give is that we need to help um, uh, in that uh, the improvement of the state of SMEs financing. We, we, we should uh, help SMEs to, uh, to impact uh, and to scale uh, more and to reinforce in, in terms of capacity. Uh, so they, they will be able to, to, to access new markets for their products. They, they will be able to be successful and sustainable. And this will help actually uh, to, to, to narrow the gap. Uh, if, if we help them developing their activities, if we, we offer them uh, some content in terms of training, in terms of uh, mentorship, in terms of uh, building their, their businesses, they will be stronger and they will be in, in a better position to, uh, to, to, to have the loans, uh, banks, uh, bank, to, to actually uh, uh, get the loans and, 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 and scale and, and develop themselves. So, so really uh, building capacity and helping them to more uh, to get more formal to to give data to to, to banks and and to to be uh, I mean really on the banking system and bankable will be will help to 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 narrow this gap on on financing indeed um consta your views thank you uh, so my takeaway will be uh, we have to build capacity uh, build capacity on the SME side and on the FI side uh, to make sure that we have enough in information to assess properly the risk of the, um, the SMEs. Because what we are discussing here is uh, about the viable SMEs. When we talk about financing SMEs, it's SMEs which will uh, contribute uh, to the GDPs of our, our respective countries. So we have to build them. We have to make sure that they have the necessary uh, input to deliver what they intend to deliver. So capacity building on, on SME side, capacity building on, on FI side, and also uh, the positive things is we are, we are doing things. Uh, when we see the panels, um, each of the panelists are doing something on SMEs. We are moving. At AGF side, we unlock $2 billion in 40 countries in 10 years, which is something. It's far from the two and uh, the 300 million, uh, billion, but it's something. It's moving fast. The needs is moving fast. Uh, we, we are talking about 40, uh, the SMEs are contributing about 40% 40, 40 of GDPs in Sub-Saharan, which is something, let's say roughly 800 billion of the GDP. So for that, we need to move fast. We need to, move, to do more than what we are doing today. And we need to work together. So MFIs, microfinancial micro institutions, banks, guarantee funds, all together we need to continue doing what we, have, we are doing now, but faster. All right, so we need to do a lot more and a lot faster. Um, Tyrus, your views, what's, what's your one key takeaway from this conversation today? I think that the, the funding gap is the opportunity. I, I think it just, it, it inspires, I, I think, do more, do faster. I do agree, I, 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 and I particularly we've observed the resilience of SMEs. I think the bounce back in certainly in Kenya's economy has been faster and larger than we had predicted, you know, post COVID, and that just speaks to those SMEs that have the capacity to ride those storms. Actually, lowers my risk, makes them better credit, and and therefore helps them access that that gap. So for those that are struggling 
to access that funding, hence that large gap. I think I do agree with everybody who's spoken before me. If we then help them to just get a little better, I think we make bigger strides um, um, at, at getting them to be more resilient, to be better credit, um, uh, and, and, and therefore to, to, to be able to grow from the, the, the credit that we might provide. So I think it's an opportunity and we need just to continue and accelerate it. Indeed, um, there's, there's an interesting comment that's coming through from uh, from from our, uh, our attendees. Uh, uh, one key game changer that's being made a very strong case here for is the enforcement of financial discipline in the financial sector. Uh, we'll certainly get to that in a bit. But Philip, your your closing views. What's your key single takeaway from this conversation? Well, my, my key takeaway is in fact related to the comment which was made by Dr. Um, Dr. Eradiri about uh, the need to uh, to think a bit out of the box and to think of what is the best approach. Um, and this reminds me again about uh, the beginning of microfinance when Dr. Mohamed Yunus started microfinance in, in Bangladesh. He, he saw a, a huge need and he thought about a very creative way how to address this need. Uh, and there's even another example which is a bit closer to the African continent. It's uh, for, from Kenya, Equity Bank. Equity Bank started as a small building society, but when they started, they did not copy uh, Standard Chartered or Barclays and so on. They decided to do things very differently and they did it in an extremely successful way. So I, I think that, um, that what is important is all the actors of the financial sector should always be willing to experiment and to think a bit out of the box. Some experiments might, might fail, but others might be, uh, might be very successful. Um, and so let's continue experimenting and seeing what works. Indeed, that certainly will be very important moving forward. Um, Dr. Eradiri, I see, is still uh, in, in the room for us, and I'd like to give you um, the closing word here, but I'll slip in a little question, if, if I may. Um, this is from the audience. How do we depoliticize access to government-supported credit guarantees if we're to have a productive lending and recovery process. Uh, Dr. Eradiri. Thank you, Rama. Um, let, let, me, let me delve into this by commending IFC. Um, IFC has given us beautiful statistics. 40 million SMEs in sub-Saharan Africa has finance gap of 330 billion. 90% of businesses in Africa that account for 60% of jobs fall under this space. Beautiful. Now, here is the demand scenario, and I can tell you that an opportunity is presented. So what do we want to do with that opportunity? I want to challenge the DFIs um, and those on the panel and all those around that are bankers. You're on the other side of the divide. But any day you stop being a banker, most likely you're going to become an SME. So whatever you do, please remember that you will finally come on the other side to become an SME. Uh, and then for the All-Africa Association for Small and Medium Enterprises asked me, we will continue to advocate for a uh, new finance recipe and a fit for purpose uh, DFI for Africa. Uh, and lastly, your, your question to me from, from the audience, uh, perhaps it will suffice to allow um, the, the financial um, uh, panelists to, to take, on, take on that view because my views will be very... Uh, will, will be quite toxic and I, I i don't want to be toxic at this time thank you <laughs> All right, then fair enough. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it there for the time being. Um, I'd like to extend a very big thank you um, to, to our audience, to the 100 plus of you who showed up uh, for this conversation, for sparing the time uh, to come in and have this conversation uh, with us around the question, the very naughty, very important question of how do we essentially ensure that SMEs can get access to the financing that they need. Uh, my thanks to my panel members, Taras Mediger, the Group Director of Retail Banking at NTBA, Philip Sigwart, CEO, Group CEO at the Barber Group, uh, Stockton Muna Diop, the Deputy Managing Director of Finance and Strategy at Bank CBIO, and of course, Constanzi, the, uh, chief, the Group Chief Risk Officer at the Africa Guarantee Fund. Uh, we'll be having a lot more of these engagements in the future. I believe the next one should be happening sometime in the second week of January. Uh, but between now and then, happy hunting. Go out there, build a business, um, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you very much. Thank you.